Good afternoon and welcome to the 2020 Striking a Balanced Caregiver Conference. My name is Rob Fabian with Age of Central Texas and along with our partners at the Area Agency on Aging for the Capital Area. We are so glad that you are joining us for this afternoon session on Caregiving 101. Now, this is the first year that we have taken our conference virtual. So if along the way we have a couple of little burps, please forgive us because we're learning as we go. But we had a great session this morning. We're going to have a tremendous session this afternoon, and we are so glad that you are joining us. Before we get started, we've got a very quick video we want to show you from our executive directors at Age of Central Texas and the Area Agency on Aging, along with a lovely video from our presenting partners over at AARP Texas. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 19th Annual Striking a Balance Caregiver Conference, brought to you by the Area Agency on Aging of the Capital Area and Age of Central Texas. We are so happy to have you join us at our first ever virtual conference. So we were talking about doing this, and you know, we had a little bit of fear and trepidation, and then we thought, well, you know, all of the caregivers that I know that exude resiliency, they exude strength. They always have the ability to turn on a dime. So we thought, well, you know what? We better honor them and we better do the same thing and host this conference virtually so, so that we would have the opportunity to engage with y'all again. Some of you might know that we have a lot of repeat caregivers attending our conference every year. We didn't want to let them down, but we also did not want to miss out on bringing in new caregivers. And virtually, we have the opportunity to do that even more. So we are so excited have you join us in a number of sessions that will address some of the issues that you might encounter during your caregiver journey. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Suzanne. Hi all, my name is Suzanne Anderson. I'm the Executive Director of Age of Central Texas. And like Patty, I am so glad you've chosen to participate in the 19th Annual Striking a Balance Conference. And you know what I love, in addition to what Patty just shared, is that if you chose, you could be sitting here in your PJs if you're so inclined. So. You know, a special thank you to the uh, Area Agency on Aging. Patty Bordy and her staff have been exceptional. In, a, in addition, you know, a special thank you to Rob Fabian of Age of Central Texas, whose leadership and technology skills have really allowed us to offer it in this format. Uh, I want to just share a quote. It's one of my favorites that I apply to my uh, life, depending on where I sit uh, within different challenges. And uh, believe it or not, it's from Lena Horn. And what she said is that it's not the load that breaks you down, it's the way you carry, carry it. So, you know, we know caregiving is full of, you know, swirling things like joy and love and stress. And I could go on and on on that one. But uh, we hope through the conference you find new strategies to help you carry that proverbial load. And that you feel supported by age and the AAA and that know that we're here for you. So thanks so much. For joining us in the conference and um, we look forward to hearing your feedback. Take care. Hello, I'm Jessica Lemon of AARP Texas and I am pleased that AARP is a proud sponsor of the Striking a Balance Caregiver Conference. As a sponsor, we hope that you are gaining new insights into family caregiving and that you have the opportunity to connect with other caregivers and experts on aging. Family caregiving is a priority for AARP it's essential to our work today, but that's not all. AARP is doing amazing things to make life better for the age 50 plus population and generations that follow. We help people improve their financial well being and their health. We want people to contribute to society and local communities and to fully enjoy life. Let's take a moment to discover more about what we're up to at AARP. Our story begins more than 60 years ago inside an abandoned chicken coop where our founder discovered a retired teacher living, no home, no health care. So she said no to this injustice and yes to transforming lives. It's this drive, this compassion that inspired AARP. Today we empower people to choose how they live as they age. We advocate for health and financial security. We strengthen communities everywhere. We are AARP creating real possibilities. I want you to know that AARP has a strong presence throughout Texas and many communities in this great state, including Austin, the capital city where I live and work. 
This year, AARP Texas is bringing opportunities to our members and others through virtual events like this one we're participating in today and on platforms like Facebook Live. We hope you have the opportunity to enjoy these free offerings. Not only are there programs to help unpaid family caregivers, but there are presentations to help people avoid being the victims of fraud. We host fitness seminars and we work with city leaders towards making this an even more age-friendly community. And know this, volunteers are critical to our mission. There are many opportunities for those who can give a little time to volunteer. You can learn more about these local happenings at aarp.org slash tx or catch us at the AARP Texas Facebook page. Again, of course, family caregiving is a priority. Here in Texas and across the country, AARP is working with governors, state legislators, and community partners to take common sense steps to support America's 40 million family caregivers. We know that caregivers help their older parents, spouses, and loved ones live independently at home. And right now, AARP is fighting to protect nursing home residents against sickness, neglect, and isolation during the COVID-19 pandemic, while also educating family caregivers on how to advocate for their loved ones. Sadly, more than 62,000 nursing home residents and staff at those facilities have died from COVID-19, and the death toll continues to mount. These are mothers, fathers, grandparents, and spouses with families who love them. Nobody should be going through what nursing home residents and their families are experiencing today. Families want elected leaders to take action now to protect residents of nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. Right now, no state is doing a good enough job to protect these residents and staff. Congress must, must take immediate action to provide regular testing and personal protective equipment for residents and staff. There should also be timely and reliable reporting of COVID-19 cases and deaths. There also must be virtual visitation allowed for families. And finally, we urge lawmakers not to let nursing homes off the hook for abuse, neglect, and even death. Now is not the time to strip away the rights of nursing home residents. AARP will continue to fight for family caregivers and other families. We appreciate your support and for listening. We have many resources available for family caregivers just like you. One place to go for information is aarp.org slash caregiving. Thank you for listening and thank you for all that you do as family caregivers or to support caregivers. Thank you, Patty and Suzanne. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you for joining us. We're glad that you're here. Before we introduce our speaker, we've got just a couple of housekeeping items we want to go over with you. Number one is that this session, along with all the sessions this week, is being recorded. So if for any reason you have an issue on your side that you get kicked off or you're having trouble with the video, don't worry. We're recording the session and we are going to uh, post it on YouTube and we will send you that link. That way you can go back later and look at the session and be able to review it, share it with friends, however you want to utilize it. Also, when you received your email reminder for this session, there were three links that were included in that in addition to the link to get onto the Zoom meeting today. I want to review those real quick for you because there's some great info there. Number one, we sent you the program for the entire week that has not only the bios for all of our speakers, but also some other great information. So take a look at that. Number two, we sent you handouts for all the presentations. So there's a lot of great information there, not only for this presentation, but for all of them this week. And then we sent you a lovely packet of resources. Age of Central Texas and Area Agency on Aging pulled together some great caregiver resources for you. And it's all in a big PDF, so you'll be able to look through those. We are going to resend those to you later this week. So if for some reason you didn't get them, don't worry, we're going to send them back to you so that you'll have those. Now, speaking of tech issues, brings us to number three. Right down here, you've got a chat feature. It looks like one of those thought bubbles that you see in the comic strips. Click on that and it'll bring up the chat over here on the side. You'll see that in there, we've given you a phone number 
for Michelle Davis, the Area Agency on Aging. If for any reason you're having difficulties with this session technically, give her a call because we have got some tech volunteers who are standing by. So we'll connect you up with one of those folks and they can help talk you through whatever issues you're having. But most importantly, we want you to ask questions during this session because again, we're doing this for you and we want you to ask those questions as they come up during the session because at the end of our session, we're gonna have a facilitated Q&A and we are gonna answer your questions. Now, because our time is a little limited today, we might not get to every one of the questions live this afternoon, but fear not, we are going to answer your question because if we don't get to it live today, one of our experts from either Age of Central Texas or the Area Agency on Aging is going to be in contact with you personally and they're going to answer your question. So ask those questions because this is why we've done this for 19 years. It is for you. We know that as caregivers, no one really ever teaches us how to be effective caregivers. It's not something that we learn in school. It's not something that is in, in us. And that's why age, an area agency on aging exists, is to help caregivers through their journey. We want to make sure that you have the resources, the knowledge, the hand up, the shoulder to cry on, whatever it is, wherever you are in your journey, we're gonna meet you where you are and give you the tools that you need. Remember, you are never alone as a caregiver because we are always going to be here to help you out. All right, so to introduce our speaker for this afternoon, please welcome Rhonda Thompson from the Area Agency on Aging, and she's gonna introduce patients. Rhonda, take it away. Hi, welcome everyone. We're glad y'all are part of the Caregiver Conference. Uh, Welcome to Caregiver 101. It is my pleasure to introduce Patience Buchanan. She's the care manager team lead at Accountable Aging Care Management in Austin. She helps individuals and families navigate healthcare and other systems. For, she has done this for more than 15 years. She has a master's in science and social work from UT Austin and has been a case manager, a skilled, uh, worked in a skilled nursing home admissions, discharge planner, and a hospice social worker. She also lives with a spunky Sheltie and her husband in Dripping Springs. Welcome to Patience. Hi everyone, thank you to Age of Central Texas for putting on this great conference. My name is Patience Buchanan. I'm a longtime social worker in Austin and have been a care manager in particular for the past six years of my career. This Caregiver 101 in the time of COVID is dedicated to the one I love. This is my beloved mother-in-law, Audrey Lois Grubbs, who had a fabulous life as a, the wife of an Air Force officer, lived all over the world. And when her husband died in the late 90s, we started seeing signs of some forgetfulness. And we did um, all the things. We took her to her primary care physician and we got referred to neurologists. And sure enough, by the early 2000s, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And again, we did all the caregiving things. Uh, a daughter came and lived with her. We, my husband and I brought her to our house to live for a short while. And we tried to keep her at home with supports. And eventually we found a memory support community in Bernie, Texas, Morningside Ministries. They did a fabulous job and she lived there till 2017. She was a textbook case of a, a person who was very pleasant, who has Alzheimer's and she was pleasant before and she was pleasant in her progression. She, we never saw the agitation and um, some of the more severe behaviors that some people display. And we were I, I hit the jackpot in having her as a mother-in-law. This may look familiar to a lot of you. It may look like what you feel like um, a lot of times. Your mind is racing, all kinds of things on your mind, to-do lists. Here are just a few statistics about 
the stress of caregiving. In the United States, 43.5 million of you are providing unpaid support to an adult family member. One third of you are also raising children. The typical amount of hours you provide of unpaid support is about 19 hours a week. Caregivers report higher stress levels than the general public. That should not be a surprise at all, but for some caregivers, it is a surprise. 55% of you feel overwhelmed by the amount of care their loved one requires. You never thought it would be this hard or this much. Here are some typical caregiver challenges. Do they live in an older adult community? Do they live with you? Do they live at home alone? Do they have a spouse that may be a little bit um, less, that needs less care than the other spouse? Here's another challenge, strain on your relationship and an emotional toll. It's a strain on your relationship with your own family, with your spouse, with your children, and having to take care of an older adult. There may be a role reversal going on. You may be parenting your parent. You may be in the sandwich generation. You may be parenting your parent while you're also parenting your children or grandchildren. What we see a lot is the worsening of the physical health of the caregiver, probably because the caregiver is deferring their own self-care. And then you have to do all the coordination, all the doctor's visits, all the medicines, and help with some activities of daily living. And we describe activities of daily living as higher level, like uh, meal planning, shopping, uh, meal preparation, driving, handling their finances. Those are the higher levels. And then there are the basic activities of daily living, like grooming and actually eating their meal. Can they use utensils still or do they eat with their hands? Uh, hygiene, general hygiene can be a challenge. So you may be helping with both instrumental and, and basic activities of daily living. And many times we see a huge financial strain in your own life as caregivers in the care receiver's life and you may be deferring some of your own career or educational goals because your hands are full and now we have caregiving in the age of covid and the stay-at-home orders and even though they got lessened a little they have they're still really strict for our older adult population and that's understandable because they are very vulnerable. If you live locally with the with your care receiver and they're in a community, you might not be allowed to pop in and visit like you used to. You might have to do through the window visits or FaceTime or Zoom calls only as long as there's enough staff to facilitate that for you. And if they live at home um, and don't need as much help, but you used to take them to do um, entertaining things, that's limited now, like the respite programs or the outings to restaurants or museums or stores, arts and crafts stores, whatever your loved one like, it may be really restricted right now. And then caregiving, from a distance, we kind of define that, or my company kind of defines it as um, more than an hour away. If you're more than an hour away, you have both COVID-19 and then you have the distance issue to deal with. And then more on the added layer of COVID-19, so limits placed on visiting family members. The possible need to quarantine if you need to move. If you need to move your loved one to a community, an older adult community, they may ask your loved one to stay in their apartment or their suite or their room for 14 days before they can come out to the rest of the community. You may be experiencing closure of your childcare, your child's childcare or educational institutions. You may have uncertainty or your family may be experiencing uncertainty with your job. You may have been asked to take a furlough. You may have been asked to take a cut in pay. So you have in income insecurity going on. And then there's restricted access to um, medicine and care providers and medical equipment. Uh, a lot of times 
the um, Many times the doctor's offices are asking uh, for doxy or telehealth or FaceTime calls instead of, or Zooms, instead of going to the physician's office, which is what you're used to. So then you have to facilitate that with your loved one. And there's the huge uncertainty of the timeline of this COVID-19 and um, when we're going to be able to get back to a more normal life. And there's a growing concern about your own health and self-care. And you have, with the COVID-19, you have increased stress. We already saw the stress. Those statistics from earlier uh, in this presentation were before COVID-19. And I have been hearing personally from all of my clients and their families that anxiety is, is really huge right now. So, So even without COVID-19, we have a typical escalation of symptoms, whatever's going on with your loved one, be it a Parkinson's, a, a, an Alzheimer's, a chronic um, other disease, diabetes, congestive heart failure. Typically over time, uh, the symptoms intensify and the disease process escalates. The care needs become greater and more services are needed. So all of those previous slides are sort of the, the bad news. Um, not really the bad news, but the, tip of the, the snapshot of what it's like. And these slides are about how you can work on providing the care without overtaxing yourself, strategies to be successful. So the first thing we always recommend is assessing the situation, focus on the most important actions. If your family, if your mom or dad are not eating well and there's um, uh, old rotten food in the refrigerator, that's, that's a priority area. They probably are, are experiencing stomach pains and illness due to that. Then you assess all the different areas and you start developing and implementing a care plan. And then you establish a monitoring system. You break down to assess the situation and in, in assessing the situation. Review the personal circumstances. Look at needs as well as what they want and what they prefer. A lot of times we see that there is a conflict in what they want and what they prefer as opposed to what they need. Determine the financial picture. Understanding the budget is, is huge. It's critical to understanding the options. If there are resources and they are adamant about staying at home, then you, I have many clients who have 24-hour care. I have a client who has two caregivers 24 hours a day. Um, but there are all kinds of options out there too. Uh, not everybody has that, those types of resources. So there are options out there, but knowing your budget is critical. And legal documents. Legal documents are big. Um, before your family, your loved one loses capacity, you probably want to get the will, the advanced directives, the medical power of attorney, and the financial power of attorney in order. So developing and implementing a care plan. You establish the budget, and then you locate care partners, other family members, neighbors, friends, and then of course, there's people like me and my company, professional care managers. Here's something that we have found during COVID-19, agency care. So which companies are able and willing to assist with COVID-19 positive clients? I have a gentleman at home, adamant about staying home, has in-home care. He contracted COVID-19. The company that he was with had to pull out. They did not have the training or the personal protection equipment, the PPE to take care of them. 
I scrambled around and found another uh, agency that was able to come in and provide him the care with the protective equipment. And now he's gotten past, he didn't even have to be hospitalized. He's gotten past the COVID-19 and he's negative. Decide on home versus older adult community. Does it make sense um, to bring your, your loved one home? I am working with a family right now who are very frustrated in not being able to touch their loved one, their father and grandfather. So we are working on a plan to bring him home. He's 96 years old. And um, it, it can be done. It's a lot of sacrifice on the caregiver, the caregiver household, but they, they absolutely want it. They don't know when this COVID is gonna end, they don't know that he's gonna pass away and they just want him at their home. Um, and respite, uh, so uh, another issue might be if there's another, if they're living with you or living at home alone and there's some sort of emergency and you can't check on, you can't be there for them, check out respite in senior living communities. At one point, Arden Courts and Memory Care Community was during this COVID-19 taking, uh, taking people into res respite. After COVID-19 le leaves, it's a good idea to get in, in mind some places where you can do just regular respite. Uh, Silverado's back in Austin and they uh, will provide respite if they have a room available. Contract for services and arrange for community resources. Take into consideration <clears throat> limiting the number of services and people coming into the home during COVID-19. Does live-in support make sense? At the beginning of COVID-19, I had a house that said, we want to do live-in. We don't want, they had, I think they had a total, they have 24 hour care. So they had about five or six different uh, caregivers coming in. So we limited the number and they lived in the home for two months during the, the first part of COVID-19. Make short term and long term plans. So how long will COVID-19 last? That's a million dollar question. Most of my families right now are making plans to be this way until well into 2021, maybe June 2021. So whatever plan they're adopting now, they're thinking it needs to last until 2021. And here are some issues for care plan decisions. So whether they're living Usually, how, how will no, nutritional needs be met is usually related to if they are living at home alone, at home with a spouse, or with you, but you have to still leave and, and not uh, can't be there 24 hours a day, and they don't necessarily need 24 hours of care. So um, you have to think through nutritional needs. Um, how will socialization and spiritual needs be met? Right now with COVID-19, they are really restricted, but there's a lot of great things um, that you can find and do uh, Zoom-wise. And most church services, which I think is a great thing for an older adult, are having their worship services uh, live, streamed live, and then recorded and kept recorded so you can watch it anytime. And so in your care plan, you also want to look at how does the house get cleaned? How does the dish, do the dishes get done? How, do the, that, how does that rotten food in the refrigerator get thrown out? And then you want to look at good hygiene. This is, uh, can be huge in the world of dementia. A lot of older adults do not like uh, taking, a lot of older adults with uh, dementias or Parkinson's do not like taking baths, so you have to be creative in the world of hygiene. And how will medicine and doctor's visits be managed? So sometimes in my experience, just getting their medicines organized and making sure that they take them as prescribed can hugely stabilize a person. Uh, and then doctor's visits, that we're not having them in person so much, so are you able to facilitate the doxy, the Zoom with them. Bill paying, bill paying is big. Uh, we refer to a, a group called Silver Bills. They do online um, bill paying for 
a lot of our clients, we also have local bookkeepers that we refer to that help people um, organize and make sure that their bills get paid. And then there's always the situation, many of you might have a, a healthy loved one and a sick loved one who are married and live together and you have to balance how much of the caregiving can the healthy spouse do without making themselves too sick. And how does all this get accomplished safely? Um, and before COVID-19, the community, the Centers for Disease Control, uh, Controls were hardly ever in our vocabulary. And now they're hugely in our vocabulary. Where do I find service providers and community resources? So um, Google is just huge and great and has all kinds of information just here in Austin or Central Texas area. They have uh, senior service directories such as New Lifestyles and Senior Resources Guide. They have, we have organizations such as the Alzheimer's Association and Age of Central Texas. We have a lot of people get a lot of information from their church, from their clergy. Uh, professional care managers such as Accountable Aging, but we're not the only ones in town. There are several in town and we have a, an association called aginglifecare.org. Area Agency on Aging, great resource. And of course now we have the CDC. So monitoring, so you've set up the plan, you know what's important, you've got the priorities, you've got an idea, an outline of what needs to happen, and now you need to start monitoring the plan. So what does that look like? In the routine world, stable world, there will be regular phone calls to the care receiver and to the service providers. Let's say you have an agency-based uh, caregivers in the house. You want to communicate with them, find out how mom or dad are doing every day. Follow-up calls with neighbors and friends. If you have neighbors and friends who are checking on them once or twice a week, you want to communicate, communicate, communicate. I, I'm an over-communicator. Family updates. At this time, I have many, many families who can't believe that they never thought of the world of Zoom, and they have regular family meetings over Zoom, which they can continue, because family may be spread out all over the United States. Care managers and other service uh, provider reports. So um, in, in my world, in the professional care manager world, we send reports to uh, the family members after each visit or doctor's visit or any, any kind of important interaction. And then some communities may allow face-to-face -face visits if you've got the appropriate personal protection equipment. You have to, this is an individual by individual community. Um, I'm considered an, an essential worker. I had a client who was on hospice and was uh, dying during during this time, and they um, and I wanted to, and they allowed me to go in. And he he was dying of Parkinson's, but he also uh, contracted COVID nineteen from one of the caregivers who didn't realize she had it. Um, so I donned the gown, the mask, of course, the face shield, the gloves, the booties, and went in and was able to facilitate. Um, FaceTime with some of his family members so they could say goodbye. And an emergency. Um, so that's a type of an emergency. Who can physically go see the situation in, a, in proper PPE? This is a good time. I don't know if you have this, but I keep it in the trunk of my car. If you can get um, a set of gowns, face shields, masks, gloves, boobies, uh, you keep it in your car because you never know when you might be told that you may visit your loved one or your loved one somehow gets COVID and is at home and you need to, and you want to be around them. And then you need to set up who, what's your, what's your tree, what's your communication tree when it comes to emergencies. 
you may want to consider an emergency response device. There's a lifeline, of course. There's a, a new watch called Unaliware. Uh, there are all kinds of emergency response devices. And then a lot of people use care managers. So one of the things that when we first meet with families that we tell them to do is, um, I call it a red folder. Create a red folder, easy reach, easy to see, or maybe put a notice on your refrigerator that says, this is where all the important information is, and then you put the red folder wherever you want to. But in the red folder should be copies of picture IDs, mom and dad or just mom, whoever, Medicare and other insurance cards. So you want your Medicare, your supplement, your RX card, a list of their medications and keep, that's something you have to keep current. So I kind of keep it in a, on a separate page because it sometimes changes. A list of your doctors or her doctors or their doctors and a list of all the emergency contacts. Who is the emergency tree? Uh, is it the daughter first and then the son next and then the other daughter? Um, or if they can't get a hold of one, so you usually want two or three or four on the emergency contacts in case the first one can't get, be uh, found. And then um, phone number listing for all contacts, so you want uh, everybody's phone information current. Most people in this day and age want to be contacted by their cell phones. Home phones are, are rarely used in emergencies. And then just general organization, you want a, scal a calendar for scheduling um, and monitoring actions and events. And what happens in a lot of older adult world is they'll have a calendar in one room and another calendar in another room and another calendar on the kitchen, um, on the refrigerator door. You really want to help them bring it to just one calendar. It's hard to keep up with one calendar, much less three calendars. So you really want a centralized area for one calendar. And then a journal or diary to record um, the summary of activities, such as the monitoring phone calls and family communications. It's good for just general organization and, and cell phones and Siri and all those devices are great for keeping track of what's going on. So, um, we also recommend to share the responsibilities to assign and or hire. So look at all the family members. Um, we frequently have one sibling who is great at the finances and one who is great at keeping records and maybe another one who uh, is very interested in the physician visits, the healthcare world. Neighbors, you may have your mom and dad are whomever may have lived in the same house for 40 years, so they have really tight and good neighbors and close friends, church friends are, are, are big. Use people aside. This is a time to, to reach out and ask for help. Now, it might not be dependable, so you have to think that through, but certainly think about people asking for help from neighbors and friends. Community resources, uh, Age of Central Texas is great. When their um, respite program, program can open, they have all kinds of, well, they have this caregiver information, but they also have other lectures and uh, they have the lending closet, the durable medical equipment lending closet. And then of course, professional care managers and professional in-home caregivers uh, services. And so you look at the who's and then you look at the what's. So who would be monitoring the phone calls? Who would be doing the bill, bill paying? Who would be helping with the social activities? Who's gonna, medic, who's gonna put the medicine in the organizers and make sure that the refills are getting done? Who's gonna be doing the grocery shopping? And sometimes with that is simple meal preparation. And then you may wanna do a comparison of service providers. There's a, several care management groups here in Austin. There are tons of in-home caregiver services here in Austin. Another, 
I, like I said earlier, I'm a over communicator. I think this is huge. Um, so communication on a regular basis with care receiver. If your care receiver does not have any forgetfulness, they may be very accurate and very uh, willing to tell you what they need, what they like, what they don't like, and that's great. Communication with other family members. Like I said, during this pandemic, a lot of families have discovered Zoom. They have discovered um, so regular face-to-face -face meetings on, on Zoom. They do email threads. Um, I have a, a family who has a private, I guess it, maybe it's a Facebook, some sort of page that's private, and they keep, keep in touch about things like that. Medical providers, you want to, to um, follow up and follow through with all of your, 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 your primary care physician, PCP of course, but also your specialist, especially if there's a, a chronic disease, a, a big chronic disease in, the, in play. And if you have hired um, caregivers or care managers, you wanna hear from them on a regular basis, and you should. Communication with neighbors, friends, and church. So be sure and, and have a regular weekly catch up with people who are closely involved with your loved one. And then of course, if you're still working, um, you need a lot of communication with your immediate family and your supervisor at work so that you can let them know things are happening um, or maybe even escalating at home. Now all of that uh, was about how to be a caregiver, how to begin your caregiving life, or many of you I'm sure are in the middle of it or toward the end of it. But um, this is what, this part of what I want to talk about is, I think, the most important thing we can do as caregivers. And that is to be the partner, the spouse, the sister, the brother, the son, the daughter, the family member, and the friend when possible. So yes, you're running around. Yes, you've got 10,000 things to do. But when you can carve out and make space and make time to sit with your loved one or your loved ones and ask some of these questions, I think these are real meaningful questions. It may be too difficult for your loved one to talk. You may want to make it a little bit more superficial, but I think there's a, it's important to listen to your loved one, to be present for your loved one, and to let them know that you are really there and are not distracted by everything else. It sometimes only takes 10 to 15 minutes. Maybe their attention span isn't really great for things like this. But just giving them your undivided attention every once in a while is a great thing. These are some of my favorite resources. Um, and I didn't want to in, inundate you. You're going to have tons of resources during this seminar. So, um, but Care Blazers is one that actually one of my clients, his wife has dementia, and he found. Dr. Natalie um, on YouTube one time, and he he sent it to me, and then now I watch her information. She has great short videos uh, free on YouTube about how to assist someone with dementia, and, uh, and she deals with a variety of commonplace issues. And then earlier we talked about uh, getting your legal affairs in order. So the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys uh, can help you with estate planning, will development, powers of attorney development, but they can also help you with Medicaid eligibility. If you have a complex case like a mom and dad who are both um, still with us and one of them needs care and the other one needs to be at home, you don't want to impoverish the spouse that stays home by paying for the care that's needed at um, a Medicaid community. So these type of attorneys can help you with Medicaid eligibility. And then the Family Caregiver Alliance out of uh, California. It's just a website full of excellent, excellent information. 
All right, that's all for me. Thank you very much. All right, thank you patients so very much for all that great information. We really appreciate it. So for all of you who are uh, joining us on the call, this is the time to ask those questions. We are going to answer all of your questions as they pertain to caregiving. We've got a great panel of experts, but before we go there, we've got a really quick video I want to show you. Hello, my name is Michael Gill, and I own Texas Senior Living Locators. I have a free consulting service helping families of seniors find assisted living, independent living, and memory care. It's a free service to you because I'm paid a commission by wherever they end up going. Unlike all the online companies, I am a service that's boots on the ground, meaning I have visited every place in town, whether it's independent living, assisted living, memory care, or small personal care homes. I'm objective, and my only goal is to help your parent find the best place for themselves. The criteria we use is to find the place that's closest to family so that family can visit as often as possible, where it's uh, an appropriate price point, because, of course, not everybody can, can afford everything that there is in a, uh, senior living, and where they get the best care possible. Now, people often ask me, why do I have to move from the house? You don't have to move from the house, and it's an intensely personal decision when the time comes to move your parent. I have three rules, however, when it is absolutely necessary that you move. The first rule is, if somebody is a danger to themselves at home, then they must move. This could mean that somebody is taking their medications inappropriately. For example, I've gotten called many times for somebody who's in a nursing home or in the hospital because they have overdosed on their uh, medications uh, by taking them five times in a row because they forgot they'd already taken them. In this case, somebody ends up in the hospital. So that's one reason why somebody may be uh, unsafe at home. Another reason may be that they're wandering outside or they're driving inappropriately or they're leaving the stove on. You can imagine all the different possibilities. The second reason that you need to move uh, from a house to uh, an assisted living or nursing home type of scenario is when somebody would be healthier if they were uh, away from home. Most of the time what this means is that they're, is that they're doing a lot of self-neglect. For example, they're not taking their medications or they're not eating appropriately or they're a big fall risk. Sometimes it's just better to be in an assisted living or memory care. The third reason that you have to move is when there are caregiver issues. By this I mean, for example, an 85-year-old woman who's taking care of her 90-year-old husband and now she's aging out of the ability to be able to give him all the care he needs. Or where the, the children can't give enough help to their parents because the parents are falling during the daylight, uh, during work hours. Or when you can no longer afford paying for enough care to come into the house and just makes more sense to move someplace else. At any rate, my name is Michael Gill. I own Texas Senior Living Locators. If you call me, I can help you find the best place for your parent or loved one. And we can do a, an efficient search together. Usually I'll put people in my car and we'll go visit places together. In times of the coronavirus, of course, that's not always possible. So what we end up doing is a lot of Zoom calls and Zoom meetings. So we're doing virtual tours. But we can get you a good, uh, a good idea of what's going on even during pandemic uh, times. Again, Michael Gill, Texas Senior Living Locators is my company. TexasSeniorLivingLocators.com. And if you want my phone number, it's 512-630-7133. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, in the program that you were sent in the PDF, you've got an uh, ad for Michael. It's got his phone number and his contact information. So be sure and check the program because there's lots of great information in there. We are now going to answer your questions. So I'm going to bring back Rhonda Thompson from the Area Agency on Aging, joining Patients Buchanan, and also Melissa Crawford from the Area Agency on Aging. And we are going to answer your questions. Go for it, Rhonda. Great, thank you. Great information, patients. Thank you very much. Uh, we had a couple of questions on grooming. One is about a husband to participate in regular grooming and then just basic grooming and hygiene. So patients, if you have something to share about that and then we'll see if Melissa has anything to add. Thank you. 
Well, I have a funny story about that. Uh, working in dementia care, I worked for Silverado. Uh, and they left Austin and now they're back in Austin for years. And um, we had a gentleman who just did not want to take off his cowboy boots, his cowboy shirt, his hat, his jeans, but he loved beer. And so we would take a nice ice cold can of beer, put it on the sink in the bathroom, and we would say, you know, Mac, as soon as you get in there and take a shower, you can have this ice cold beer. So we kind of used a, a little bit of, of bribing, but we got him to take a shower. The Care Blazers information that I gave you in my uh, information, Dr. Natalie, Care Blazers YouTube video, she has great videos about it. I've seen other um, groups talk about hand over hand and you kind of make a, a spa-like environment. I don't know, uh, you know, we did this for women a lot. Uh, aromatherapy, soft music, dim lights, and you made it really warm and comfortable for them to go in and um, uh, to the bathroom. And it be, it, it's just kind of a fun situation. I had a couple and I literally told the gentleman who was taking care of his wife, I said, get in the shower with her. Do it, just both of you take a shower at the same time. It, it's a, a loving thing to do and a loving way to, to try to make it happen. Great, Melissa is, uh, Crawford is our program manager for care coordination and she uh, is uh, over the caregiver support program. So you probably have some additional information on that and then, Melissa, I have a, a, a next question for you after that. So tell us about grooming and hygiene. Well, my first response was going to be the same one, is that, the, you know, you're pairing it with something that they really want or, you know, somewhere they really want to go. I don't know. Ice cream seems to pop up a whole lot <laughs> <laughs> as they get older, and they just really want that ice cream. So, you know, like, you know, again, it's, it's the bribe technique. But it could also be maybe it's the right person. Um, if you have multiple people that are that are a kind of a part of this caring team and maybe, you know, they're upset with me because I'm the one that's making them take their medicines that they don't really want to take. And so, you know, some passive aggressive behavior could be around, floating around. And, and they're like, no, I'm not going to do that too. You know, but my sister can come in who never makes mom take the medications and she'll do anything for my sister, which is also, you know, helping her bathe. Um, it could also be, you know, like you said, the environment, um, creating a space and, and along with the environment, um, also making sure to get it as efficient and simple as possible. If, if you're trying to get them talked into it and they finally come around and they're finally going to do it, but now you got to go prepare the space and get the chair ready and get all the stuff out. By the time you're ready, they're done. They've, they've moved on. They thought it already happened. So, the, you know, if you're dealing with somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia. So, to kind of have the setup going, my sister and I paired together to help my granny. And um, so, so when we knew it was a good time because, it, and you have to be flexible, just because you want the bath to take place at six o'clock, the bath may not take place at six o'clock. And so you, you kind of have to be monitoring and you know kind of how their day's going and when they're kind of in a, in a uplifted kind of a fun, and we can say, hey, you know, I was thinking maybe we could go get some ice cream. You know, I got to wash up a little bit and you can get washed up. We'll, we'll put on something fun and let's go get ice cream. I understand with COVID there's some more challenges, but I think this is something we could still do. So I, I think those would be some of the things that I've encountered. Great, great. Thank you so much. So we had a question on how uh, to find a live-in caregiver and any recommended resources on that. So Melissa, do you want to start that one and then we'll... Uh, go with patients? Sure. Um, I can talk about other, like other resources besides the live-in. I, I would reach out probably first to individuals that you know, or your church group, or another civic community that you're aware of. There's also a lot of things online. I would check everything out. I would look at, you know, if you pick something that looks good, it reads good, still check it out. Go and look at um, other feedback on this agency or whomever it is you're you're looking at but sometimes you know that might be a bit of a process and you're kind of needing help now a situation occurred they just came home from the hospital um, and so there are agencies that can provide short-term temporary assistance we talked about age and the kind of the adult daycare 
Um, and then the Area Agency on Aging provides short-term temporary assistance for individuals who maybe um, they now realize they need some long-term um, in-home support. And so maybe they're gonna be applying for the state, but that can take 10, 12 weeks um, to get put in place. Um, the Area Agency on Aging can provide short-term temporary assistance in the home. And, and although there are some COVID challenges, um, there are still attendants and, and agencies out there that are providing the PPE that allows attendants to go in. There are individuals that, um, that, are, that are fine with that. So if you're a person that's evaluated that and you realize, you know, I had family coming in, but they're not coming in now and I, and I really need help. And, and like we talked about in the other one, how important it is to kind of prevent the caregiving burnout. And like patients brought up about trying to figure out kind of what are your resources and as far as people and, and, and tools to help you do this really vast caregiving job and sharing responsibilities. And if there's an agency that can come out and help you for eight, 10, 12 weeks, while you kind of um, digest what's happening and prepare a long-term care plan if that's what's needed or just a period of time for recovery, um, the Area Agency on Aging is a good place. They'll do it. Uh, it's person-centered, very, very important to listen to your caregiver. Um, you know, um, the field workers aren't gonna go out there and just say, well, this is what we see as your situation and this is what we think you need. They're gonna listen to you. They're gonna listen to the family, the caregiver and the care receiver. They're gonna come along. We recognize that this is not our journey, this is their journey. And we're gonna come alongside their journey and, and work together to develop a care plan that's what that family is needing and looking for. So, um, so that's what I have um, as far as the, um, the at-home support. Um, is okay. that short free assistance while yeah. you had a long-term care plan? Great, do you wanna mention the voucher program at all or? Yeah, absolutely, great. So, so I mentioned agencies and we work with a bunch of agencies, but let's say um, like with my grandmother has dementia and is very oh, far down the way. Um, when she was, and um, you know, we weren't comfortable just letting anybody come into the hall yeah. and being around. And Granny wasn't really okay. You know, she's feeling very vulnerable. She knows there's some issues. So the voucher allows a family to pick somebody they know that's not living with the caregiver, but it, it could be a niece or a grandson or a friend, you know, a church member that wants to come in that this individual and the family is comfortable with. They understand this um, individual and then we'll re we'll pay that individual to provide that care and this is great especially since we provide service in 10 county region a lot of rural areas where some of even our agencies don't have attendance in that so so this really opens up this this option where maybe it wasn't before we had the voucher program great thank you Melissa patients what can you add uh, to this well, in terms of, yeah, in terms of live in um, coming from the care management world and the service provider world, we would generally talk to them about the budget and if they wanted to hire a private duty agency. Uh, we usually recommend agencies because if there's an absence, then they can fill it in. Um, and agencies, some of the agencies do reduce the, the um, rate when it is a 24 hour situation. But it's a very expensive option, to be real honest. Yeah. Super expensive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Uh, great information. We did have a comment, uh, and I'm just going to mention this comment. It's, it's from a retired banker, and he said he has seen too many instances where caregivers take advantage of the patients that they're uh, in regard to finances. So his recommendation is to uh, have a third party to review credit card statements and bank statements on a frequent basis. Patience, do you have anything else on that or, or Melissa, either one on comments on that one? Well, one of the things that I mentioned during the presentation is bill paying and uh, that's where we started using, helping families use Silver Bills, which is an online mm -hmm. service that was, um, uh, that's out of New York, but they've got attorneys and CPAs who have their own yeah. uh, ethics, and so they are not supposed to be doing things like that. So having a third party is a great idea. We have a local bookkeeper here when people want somebody face-to-face -face that we re refer to. So I think that it is a good idea to have somebody constantly monitoring. The other 
great um, resource that we have now is TrueLink. It's not us, TrueLink, it's online, you can look it up. And it's a card, it's a special credit card that has hard stop that, you know, no telephone, no chair, you know, they really have ways and then yes, HEB, but you know, no Amazon or whatever you want to do. They have a way that families can help monitor uh, the spending of their money. Melissa, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I just want to say that absolutely it does it does happen, which is why you, you want to stay like patients said earlier, communicate, communicate, you know, with everybody yeah, in the bubble yeah. so that so that you're not just like, okay, we've got something set up and then we're gonna walk away because this is going because things things are gonna happen. And it's really, you know, it's good also, you know, I know this individual is a retired banker, but I've also known individuals who their bank is the one that will say, we see some things happening and, and yeah. it's really great that, that the banks are trained to yeah. recognize mm -hmm. exploitation that could be taking mm -hmm. place you know, in, in individuals and they'll kind of call them out, pull them aside and, and check in. But you can't, you can't rely on that in its entirety. So yeah, yeah no, I, I think that was a very great valid point that was brought up. Good. Okay. And then we had another question come through uh, from a daughter who one of, I think one of two daughters is my interpretation. She might have to give us a little more clarification, but she said when the care receiver is still at home, ideally and in the home of, of where they, they live at, with the caregiver, what equipment is necessary at both locations? So Melissa, you want to start on this one? Sure. Um, um, I mean, it's kind of vague, but yeah. Yeah, but uh, well, I I can um, answer because that's kind of the situation we had with my granny. She was at home, but then and she lived with my uncle, but he worked all the time, so she was also very a large part of the time at our house. So we equipped both homes, yeah. and you know the basics, you know just right off the bat, it's gonna at least I think is the grab bars and the railings that you know, as we all know, it's like sometimes you know the walking starts fading a little bit but not enough that they want to use a cane. And then if they have Alzheimer's or dementia, they may forget how to use the cane or the walker or whatever. And if you watch them, they're gonna, they're gonna lean on walls, on furniture, in the bathroom, it could be the towel rack. So wherever they're putting their hands, even though you're telling them, use your walker, use your cane, when you're not looking, they're probably not doing it. So to have a grab bar or something there that it, should they grab it, it will actually hold their weight. Uh, then there's gonna be, you know, the bathroom safety, a lot of falls happen in the bathroom. So besides the grab bars, um, it's gonna be like the raised toilet seat or an elevated commode, um, the shower chair, if they're able to step into the tub, it could be a transfer bench. If, um, if they're not able to, you may consider, you know, the more expensive, you know, just a, a tub to shower conversion, if you're able to do that, uh, ramps, um, if, if that's where we're at. Um, but, but in addition to the, the equipment that you're bringing in, you're also going to want to remove some things. Um, the, the rugs that are slip hazards, the, any clutter, tables that are in bad places, um, dangerous tables, because um, a lot of times their, their peripheral vision is going to be impacted and, and they may not no longer see what's down here. That, that table that's been there for 20 years you know, they may not see that table anymore. Yeah, yeah. So those are all, and there's like a lot of good places to go and look for, you know, making your, your home safe um, for your individual. So that's a very good point and, and something you should do very early on um, as far as putting those safety features in place. Or let's say, um, or right when, if, if they have a health crisis and they come home, um, so sometimes we don't know everything's going fine. Then there's a stroke or there's a cold. Yeah. Right away, that, those are some things. That, and when you get home health out, they're going to come in and they're going to talk to you about safety things as well. And then there's things for getting in and out of a vehicle that are very helpful mm -hmm. um, to keep individuals safe. You, don't, you know, you're trying to avoid, you know, that fall that really could be the turning tide for, you know, for your individual. So, and, and then patients, Patience, what do you? Well, exactly everything that Melissa just said. A lot of people, I get a lot of calls, and they just want a quick consult with us. They want us to come out to the house, look around. We have lists of handymen or big companies that purposely make places really good. 
Okay, um, I don't see any other questions that have popped up. So I think um, both of y'all did great. Patience, wonderful presentation. Oh, oh yeah, great job, everyone. <laughs> Uh, and Melissa, thank you for your information. I know that um, Age has great services that are available. Area Agency on Aging has great services. Um, Area Agency on Aging, I'm, I happen to work for them, so I can talk a little bit about that. We have, we do have ten counties that we serve. So any of those ten counties, and and Rob, you can you mentioned the program before that is available to all the participants. It has all of our information in there. You can look at that. Um, and see if, you know, you can contact any of the presenters, any of, you know, us or age, and just say, what about this? If you have any questions that, oh, uh, yeah, let me check. Okay, that's good. I already looked at that one. Uh, but yeah, any questions, certainly, I know, I'm like, there's a new one. Um, but certainly follow up with us. We are happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. I, I, I oh. want to say one, I want to say one thing if I can because I don't want to and, and patients brought this up and she was talking about the emergency response for oh, the yes. person that was talking about the safety at home. Um, I, I just can't speak enough about getting an emergency response button. And they call it different things. Um, and, and through the area agency on aging, we can get one of those for you temporary three or four months. You can that'll pay for the installation. And then if you want to continue it, you can. Sometimes it's just a short lived thing. But it's so important, especially in the situation where this person was was a long distance, you know, they lived somewhere else, then you can be that caller, um, that first, the person that they would call in the event uh, of a situation. Not only that, if you're a, a spouse, maybe you both have health issues. And if something happens, you're not likely to be able, yes, you're there for your spouse who just fell, but you're rattled or something else, you can push the button you know, and you and you can know help is coming. Somebody knows about the situation. Um, so, so I would strongly encourage anyone to get that um, when you're also when you're thinking about other health and safety things in the home. Lots of great resources out there. Thank you. And I just wanted to add that when we're talking about uh, bringing someone into your home for a live-in, we always highly recommend that you go through an agency. It's the temptation is always there to jump on Craigslist and find somebody, but things you need to understand, like patients said, is that what happens when that person can't come? You know, their kids get sick and they can't come. Well, you're stuck. With an agency, they will always have backups for you. Also, you've got to look at the issue of uh, your homeowner's insurance is not going to cover that person that you hire off a of Craigslist. You have to have a separate insurance on them. If they hurt their back helping dad out of the tub, you're not covered unless you've got that separate insurance. Also, you hiring that person, you are their employer. You have to pay their taxes and you are required to do their withholding and their taxes and that's something you don't want to have to get into so it's always so much better to go through a bonded agency and both age of central texas and area agency on aging have resource centers that can help you find folks mm -hmm. that fit your budget yes. that will be in the area that can fill, fulfill your need and that's just my final reminder to you is that both Age of Central Texas and Area Agency on Aging are your best friends when it comes to caregiving. We have resources we want to give you for free. We have expertise we want to give you for free. We have education programs outside of these conferences we want to give you for free. So no matter where you are in your journey, and your journey will change, and as it does, new things are going to crop up that are going to be big surprises for you. And that's why we're here to always please come back to us and let us help you in that journey because that's why we exist. That's why we go to work every day. All right. And also, if you check the chat box uh, to all participants, the CDC safe, home safety checklist is there. And we can make sure that goes out to you as well uh, in our resources. Right. right. We, will, we will send that to everybody. In addition, we when we send you the uh, we send you the links and we send you the uh, link for this presentation on YouTube. We're also going to send you a PDF of patients uh, presentation with 
that has all of her PowerPoints. So that way you'll have that that you can review because those great uh, resources that she had at the end, I know trying to write all that stuff down just doesn't work. So we're gonna send those out to you as a PDF so that you'll have that as well. All right, and we're also gonna be sending you a survey later as well. We would like your feedback to us because we said this is our first time doing this virtually. So <laughs> tell us what we did right, tell us what we did wrong. Uh, and most importantly, tell us what you want next time. Next year's our 20th anniversary of the Striking Balance Caregiver Conference. So Yay. tell us what are the issues you're dealing with? Because I guarantee you every single uh, presentation that we're doing this year, those came from last year's surveys and so you tell us what information you need and that's what we are going to bring to you patients thank you so very much for your expertise we appreciate it so much Rhonda melissa thank you for joining us and helping us out as well and finally thank you at home for watching we are so grateful that we have the opportunity to be a part of your journey and your life as a caregiver anytime you need us we are here to help you if you're going to join us later in the week we certainly hope so uh, we have got four more days of great presentations including our keynote with uh, nationally renowned uh, author and speaker Marty Richards is going to join us in two days uh, we're going to be talking um, tomorrow about legal issues we have got a uh, great presentation coming up later in the week on activities that you can do with your loved one who has cognitive issues so tremendous amount of information still to come we hope that you have a great restful rest of your day fingers crossed we all get some rain and we will see you later this week thank you for joining us Thanks. Thank you.